segment one. I don't know. Twelve. Twelve. And I still don't know the answers, <laughs> but I wrote a song called Where Are the Answers? Hopefully me. Hi, I'm Turley, and this is Laura, and this is what we call a podcast, uh, doing a, what's the word we want, a synopsis of my new book, Blindsided, which can be purchased, by the way, at www.turleyriches.com. It's all over there. There's albums you can download, singles, all kinds of stuff. No shirts or nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what we need to do. Maybe that, we'll eventually get there. Like right? that Richard Pryor shirt you've got. You put your face on a shirt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Logan. I wish, I wish <laughs> Richard was still alive so he could see the shirt I had on. Said, so what's it said? I don't know. Yeah, we won't. We won't. Say oh, that yeah. he, well, you know, he never <laughs> ends a word. So, yeah. But no, <laughs> no ending to it. Anyway, right now we're uh, in the book. We're pretty much after the TV show. I got a lot of bookings locally, and some people were sending me out to get some uh, corporate work, uh, just doing shows and stuff, which I'm hoping to be doing here very soon, but more of a lecture singing concert or, or a, a, a job, whatever you want to call it, a booking. Sing a little, talk a little. Sing yeah, a little. so, you know, it's going to kind of make it a little different than just lecturing, but to lecture about the book. The defeat is no option. Always try. You will never fail as long as you try. All that kind of stuff that I didn't realize that meant that much to other people because I just did it naturally with a mom that I had who guided me into that whole world that I, I don't know what it's like to stop. So, you know, look at me, 73 years old. Look at that. I got that. I'm 73. Sorry, darling. That. Okay. <laughs> well, her. The lovely. You. The lovely. <laughs> Anyway, so <laughs> this could go on for a while. <laughs> kind of what happened after the TV show, uh, they wanted me to do five more years. And once again, I turned down something I probably shouldn't have turned down, but I did. I, I just didn't see doing any more shows without being able to bring, you know, some stars from outside in. Because mm -hmm. there's only so much talent in each town, and Louisville's size of the town doesn't have that much. They have really good talent, but not that many different things to cover 13 shows and then multiply that by five and you're talking 65 shows. So, you know, uh, that's why I basically turned it down. Um, try to use a band a little bit and ended up back to solo. That's solo is who I really am. All the big shows I did through the years were with, you know, me opening or being a second opening act, uh, me on the guitar against all the big bands, Moody Blues, um, well, I can't really say Black Sabbath and Deep Purple, but I was on the same stage. I didn't play right after them or before them. But I was in the midst of all that with a solo guitar. And then uh, a friend of mine from California called and said, you know, he was involved with another guy that were starting a record label up. They called it Calliope. And they wanted to make an offer to me, and they did, and I accepted it. I uh, took three-fourths of a band uh, to California. I had to wait to find a bass player out there. Uh, and we recorded, and three or four cuts on there are pretty good. I think most of it's not very good at all. The budget was a little too low. Um, and the the problem was the one of the owners, not the one that called me, but one of the owners, a uh, Jewish guy, he, I don't think he understood that I was a Christian, but what he did, he wanted to name the album. <laughs> you want to say it? The Prince of Darkness. The Prince of Darkness. And I said, Lee, don't you know what the Prince of Darkness is? <laughs> he, he didn't know. I said, okay, well, there you have it. Um, so we ended up with a little squabble, and we, we finally uh, agreed to disagree and, and parted ways. And the album never got released. No. Over oh. argument over a name. He was so obstinate. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, you had deep religious beliefs to back that up, but he was just, he just wanted his way. Yeah. Yeah, that's a shame. That's what it appears to be, yeah. So after that was over with, uh, I was still back here in Louisville, and uh, that would have been 1974. And that was also the same year I met Patty, uh, the mother of my children. Um, hung around here for a while, went down to Nashville for 
uh, actually Atlanta first for a month and a half, two months, and then Nashville for another two, and then back to Louisville again. But I uh, started singing solo a lot, and everybody kept saying, man, why don't you do another record? And, you know, like nobody knows, oh, well, I'll just go do a record tomorrow. It'll be out Tuesday. Um, <laughs> so I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. And I did something that I tell everybody when I'm training them uh, of not to do. But this was 74, so I actually took a bunch of songs, about eight or nine songs I had, and put them on cassette. Remember those things? Those square <laughs> things? Like, well, anyway. Oh, Hole in the Middle. Yeah. Like <laughs> and I sent out to ten record labels, probably eight or nine songs on each one. And I always tell everybody, three songs only, and don't send it out to everybody at once. You know, that can end up not being a good uh, thing. So I did that, and nine of the ten labels wanted to sign me. One of them was actually Rocket Records, which was Elton John's label, or at least he uh, had the money behind it. Uh, and when I chose the label, I decided to choose the one that was closest to me, which was Nashville, and it was CBS Epic. But that was really not a smart move either because what gracious was that? <laughs> something on the computer. Yeah, something on the computer. <laughs> Hi, did I do it? <laughs> Is it 10 minutes up? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> so anyway, I, um, I chose the wrong label, and, and you know, because that, that was a good old boy place down in Nashville, and I, I love a lot of the men and women down there that I've met, but it was not the right label, because every time my album came out in 76, 77, called West Virginia Superstar, and when I went out to do promotion on the record at some of the record stores, they had it in the country section because they saw it was recorded in Nashville. So that, that kind of hurt things a little bit. And then I had a very serious thing happen uh, in 76, I think it was. Uh, this eye, my right eye, the remaining eye that I had hemorrhaged and started bleeding a lot. And so... I had to go have it removed. Okay, I'm confused. Was all this before or after the second TV show? Uh, this is after. Thank you very oh, much. Okay. Let me finish this <laughs> and then I'll back up one year. <laughs> Smart that way. As Paul Lynn would say. Anyway, so I, I had to have that eye removed and now I have two beautiful prosthetics if you can see them. They're beautiful blue eyes. $4,000. Okay. For another 500, I had a light put in them. That would been cool. Anyway, what she's talking about in 75... I ended up going down to Florida and raising a million dollars to do a TV pilot show of my own. I had a, uh, a producer guy that wanted to do it. He didn't have the money, so I said I can get the money. And we went to California, and we were what we we're going to do is try to syndicate the show. It was going to be called the, the Wonderful World of Music, and I was going to be a co-host on every show with a star. So one of the, we shot three episodes. One was with Johnny Mathis, the other with Lynn Anderson. What was her big, and I beg your pardon, yeah. And then one with Jonathan Winters, was the picture of Jonathan right here. Mm -hmm. That was an accident, how it happened, but God, was it ever the thrill of my life. I was a Jonathan Winters fan way back. I love my frickin', you know what I mean? Yeah. And you just happened to be down the hall from him. Doing another and show. somebody knew that you really liked him. And that picture is um, when he the moment him. when he tapped Shirley on the shoulder, unbeknownst to him. Somebody had gone and gotten him down the hall. He so just, it's a pretty genuine, um, oh, yeah. it's a pretty he, amazing picture. He tapped me on the shoulder and said, Shirley, I go, what? I was real busy with the floor director because I was co-producer. He goes, Jonathan Winters. And I'm like, whatever look I had. <laughs> it was just lucky somebody caught the shot. Yeah. And uh, loved the guy. He did a, he did a, he offered to do it. He said, what are you doing here? And I told him. He said, well, I'm about to finish over there. If you want me to do a segment with you, I will. And I went, are you kidding me? <laughs> so I got him for that. But that TV show also ended well, up on the... Something went nuts with that. could call it the cutting room floor. Uh, <laughs> well, got somewhere. Yeah. I, uh, I came back home, and over a period of weeks, I was not able to reach this guy. And I finally called the bank that we put the account in in, in California, and found out that it was empty. There should have been. And for the rest, we'll have to read the book because we're yeah, out of time. Yeah, over eight hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, so the rest of that story is on the book, as Boss Mama said. Sneaky, huh? <laughs> She'd be a Boss Mama. So I've got what about thirty seconds? About three. 
three. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, anyway, so back to how you can get my book is www.turleyrichards.com and all the information you want on there. And I'm looking for bookings. So if any of you have got private parties, corporate parties, anything that you might want to have, a poor old blind guy to come to play for you. Anything regional. We're in Louisville, Kentucky. And yeah, anything right. within four or five hours, mm -hmm. you know, Columbus, Cleveland, all those kind of things. Okay, right? Tell me when.